I don't have anybody doing 20 sets a week. Good example would be Mike Menser's hit and the high volume camp. That's where I kind of like refer out to like Eric Helms, like, hey, you know, how would we go about, you know, programming this in a practical way? Okay, so I'm going to kick things off by talking about volume. The general recommendation given is 10 to 20 sets per body part. You've been able to progress with what would be considered relatively low volume, even using Dorian Yates and Mike Menser style training in the 90s at Bob's gym. Can you talk about your experience with volume and how people can figure out their sweet spot in as much detail as possible? Man, yeah, that's a, that's we're starting with a loaded question right out the gate now. So 10 to 20 sets, it's kind of like that loose, broad recommendation. Like, do we do 10? Do we do 20? And I always tend to start my athletes on the lower side of things. And it could even be below 10. And especially if we're talking about someone who's maybe beginner and intermediate. Like, could you imagine if someone's form is not all that great, you know, and then all of a sudden you're starting them at 20 sets. Well, now you're teaching them to do 20 bad sets. So it's like, let's just start them on the low side of things. Let's focus more so on the quality of movement. Uh, it's like anything you do. Like if you're learning how to ride a bike, it's like, hey, let's not give you a fancy brand new bike with 20 gears on it. Let's let's just start you with the bike with some training wheels. Let's just learn how to kind of sit on that bike upright, learn how to start pedaling. Don't worry about like how many sets you're doing or how much load you're moving or how many reps you're getting. Like let's just, just like basically just methodically start slow, gain some skill moving from A to B. Once you're proficient with that, then we can kind of look at, okay, how do we progress now? So if we're starting, let's say at six sets per week, but those are like really good, clean six sets. Now it's like the focus should be like, let's try to increase the loads now with the same type of proficiency going from A to B. Okay. Let's try to increase some reps as well. And then once you start to plateau out, then the question becomes, why am I plateaued? You know, if you're plateaued because of fatigue, then it would make no sense to add a bunch of sets in because you're just going to add a bunch more fatigue in there. So you might mean like, hey, you actually need to take a step back. Let's take a week or, or so to lower the demand down. So maybe you're working with lighter loads for a week or two, see if you get recovered and then attempt to go back to some of the progressions. And if you start to move again, then your volume is going up from that baseline of six sets per week. Now, if you're plateaued, but you're very energetic and you're recovering super, super well, then, yeah, you might need to increase some volume. But it, you wouldn't go from, let's say, six sets all the way up to 20. You would say, OK, let's go from six to maybe eight. And then you rinse and repeat the same process that I just I just talked about. So you said just gradually kind of just step things up. And what you realize by doing this is that where your sweet spots as far as your ability to perform and your ability to recover from the work that you're doing. And then over time, as you get more experience, you kind of know where your sweet spots are. You'll start to realize like, okay, my sweet spot is six to 12 maybe, or it's maybe it is you're a little more higher volume. Like you don't get good responses with the lower side. Maybe you do have to, you know, eventually get yourself up to that 15 to 20 set range. So it's just a, it's just slowly and methodically over time, you know, as you gain experience, you'll start to, to understand where your sweet spots need to be. But I always, I always want to go on the air side of like the lower end, you know, again, to focus more so on the quality. And if you're starting off on the lower end, would there be an expectation that you would be training, I guess, closer to failure or is that That's not a really skill set training? in itself? So like, I wouldn't expect someone who's very new to training to like, okay, let's push you to failure all the time because we need to make sure you're moving from A to B first and doing that safely. I think like learning how to, you know, go to failure, it, it should be a, so it's a skill. So I would say, okay, maybe we take the exercises that are safe to do so, or it's like, say it's a dumbbell lateral as an example, or maybe an isolation exercise, like a bicep curl or a tricep press down or something like that. Those are probably fairly safe to go to failure. So let's just do that one set only and the last set only. So that way we're not generating a lot of fatigue. And then again, kind of seeing how they look doing that because you can go to failure but the last set or two or the last rep or two rather might not look all that great so it's like we need to learn how to actually you know in a sense kind of like tom brady in the pocket you know if you yeah. got like a bunch of blitzing outside linebackers like okay how do you respond 
under pressure like that? You know, are you folding and caving and throwing the ball out of bounds? Or are you slipping, taking a side step to the left and throwing a nice pass because you're more calm and collected? So that is, a, in a sense, like a teaching moment as well, getting to understand and learn how to train to failure. You mentioned recovery. So I know like a lot of intermediates may go on the high end of that where they're doing 20 sets because they think, you know, being on the top end of that range is what you're supposed to do or it's the best practice. If they're not progressing, is there ever an opportunity for them to maybe lower the volume and kind of start from scratch and building that up and making sure that they're doing a well, good job? Or, yeah, yeah. or how would you think through that? Well, my experience, like, you know, training for 38 years now and on a very high level and, you know, being a coach now for 15, I don't have anybody doing 20 sets a week. Okay. Just to be upfront and honest, because when I see people doing higher volumes like that, usually what you end up seeing is people sandbagging it halfway into their training sessions. And maybe you've experienced this. I know I've experienced 100%. it like half halfway in a training session. You're like, I'm starting to get tired, but I have like five exercises to go. And I got like 20 gazillion sets still on my plate. Like, how am I going to get through this? Then you start to like lower down your intensity because you know, you have so much work ahead of you. Then the, then the question becomes, what does the quality look like with those sets? Are you even getting close enough to failure to ensure you're getting effective reps? Cause you want to make sure that you're bringing in, you know, plenty of muscle fiber to the party. So if you're leaving five reps in the tank and you're doing 15 reps, let's say, then chances are you're not recruiting as much muscle as you probably should be. So it comes down to the quality and effic efficiency equation. Like, why am I doing 20 sets when they're fluffy? Like, yeah. let me just, let me cut that in half or let me cut that down by 60, 70%. And in a sense, going from here, now going down closer to the bullseye. So it's, the analogy would be like, okay, how many darts does it take to hit the bullseye? Do I need 10 darts or do I need three? So you learn how to get more skilled at throwing those darts to hit the bull bullseye. Awesome. And do you feel like there is a variance um, in volume per person required based on different muscle groups? Like, do you do the same amount of sets for each body part? Has that worked for you personally? Or have you found that uh, certain exercises or muscles require more volume for yourself? Sure. Like as a competitive body or myself, like, you know, of course I assess my physique, where's my strength, where's my weaknesses. And, you know, of course I'll try to allocate maybe a little bit more work towards those areas I want to improve on, but everybody's different. Everybody's genetics are different. Everybody's goals are, could be different too. Like, you know, you might have some lifters that don't really care about having you know big calves. You know, I don't care about my calves or I don't care about my legs and you know, I just want arms and chest or wh what have you. So you kind of I have to look at that. But, you know, your genetics, my genetics are different. Like, you know, I might do two sets and grow like a weed. You might do 10 sets and get the same amount of growth. But two sets for you, you're not going to get anything out of it. So I don't think we should compare like I try not to compare myself to other people. Like I don't like say like I wouldn't say, hey, Vroom, what's your how many sets a week do you do? And expect to find my answer based on what you're doing. I got to think about myself as my own baseline. So each athlete that I work with, that's what I'm like. Okay, I take the science and the research, get the, the generalizations, right? Okay, that 10 to 20 sets per week. Okay, from there, I'm like, okay, let me start breaking down their life context. Because, you know, doing 10 sets a week, it's going to take a lot less time than doing 20 sets a week. And if someone's working you know, five, six days out of the week, they're working 50 plus hours a week, like doing 20 sets in a session. I'm like, they're going to be in the gym for like, I don't know, two, three, four hours maybe. And then, you know, they're going home to maybe a spouse that's not too happy. Yeah. Cause you're on the couch just sleeping. <laughs> well, it's like my wife will be like, Hey, you know, I've, I've cleaned the house. I've done this for my kids. And what are you doing? You're at the gym lifting weights. Like, come on. So it's like, you have to be reasonable with the programming from a life perspective um but yeah going back to like what body part to target more it's, it comes down to like where's the strength where's the weakness and then, you know i can't say up front like which body part will respond better to other body sport parts it's just trial and error yeah i didn't mean uh like is there a specific body part i meant more um do you find that there's variances between different people and oh yeah for sure more you have to do that that was yeah, kind of more sure of I mean, you can look at Eric Helms as an example. You know, he has to do like a gazillion sets. 
to get a result where I go in there and I can just, you know, like do two, three, four sets and I'm probably going to get the same type of result that he's does. But the only way to find that out is through trial and error. And, you know, back in the day, I think it was 2011 or 12 when he trained with me for about a month straight and he was doing high intensity training, a low volume. And we actually saw regression with his upper body. Really? So okay. even though it was like, damn, Jeff, you're killing my gains here. It was almost like, well, you can thank me now because because of that trial and error. Now, you know, they gave you clues moving ahead as far as where your volume needs to be. And of course, he's explored since then, you know, with more frequency and more volume in his upper body. And he got the response that he was looking for. So now he kind of knows like, OK, I need more volume for my upper body versus his lower body because the lower body responds well with with lower volumes. Awesome. All right. So next question here is, so as a fan of basketball, you actually had a analogy that hit home with me. You compared Rick Barry and Steph Curry with free throws. Uh, so the technique is wildly different, but they're both standardized and they both shoot around 90% from the free throw line. So can you maybe talk about how that applies to bodybuilding? It's like the, the form question, right? It's, you see the people with like really pristine and perfect form. And I kind of get lumped into this camp because I do put a lot of emphasis on trying to make my movement patterns very clean. So the eccentric or the lowering part of the rep, you know, it, it's on average, I would say it's like maybe three seconds. I don't count in my head, like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, but in a sense, I think like, okay, let me fight gravity. So that way the weight stays more controlled. You know, if I'm letting the weight drop fast and it's like, you kind of lose tension too. So you lose the benefit of the eccentric. Um, so I just have more control there. And then sometimes I'll pause to just kill momentum and then the concentric is explosive but yet under total control uh, so sometimes people will look at that and go well you could be holding yourself back because you might be able to lift heavier which might be the case but then the question becomes if i lift heavier and if my form does break am i now using leverage or momentum to help me lift the weight so you have that argument. And then someone like myself would look at someone with maybe looser form where, you know, they're using leverage, they're using momentum to help move the weight. You know, maybe they're grunting and yelling and using a lot of energy to do these things. But yet it's hard for me to say whether they would actually see more benefit with that or less benefit because you would have to do a controlled trial on that person doing two, two different ways for a long period of time while controlling not just that variable, but everything else that they do in the real world, sleep, you know, hydration, nutrition, stress levels, like, and this is not, it's just not possible in the real world to be able to do that. So as long, the way I kind of see it now, as long as your form is standardized, meaning whatever way you're doing it, whatever style, that's how I see it as just a style, Rick Barry, granny shot style, Steph Curry, traditional shot style, like as long as it's standardized, and you're being safe and you're able to progress from that baseline that you're working with, then chances are you're going to see progress. Yeah. What's funny is that Steph Curry actually says that Clay Thompson has a more textbook shot than him. I've heard that. So yeah. even at that level, like Steph Curry is probably the greatest shooter of all time. And he's right. saying, well, you know, Clay's more textbook. So if you wanted to copy someone's style, you should copy Clay. But, you yeah. know, Steph's out here shooting half court shots, like hitting like eight in a row. So. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I thought of like, okay, when I was thinking, because, you know, you, you get that debate online as far as the bodybuilding world with the form. And I'm thinking in my brain, like, what's a good analogy with that? And I'm like, well, Rick Barry, you know, that granny shot, like, like that's just so unorthodox. It's, you know, in a sense, an outlier. And I, I remember reading, like, he was trying to get Shaq to shoot his free throws like that. Cause Shaq, of course, he's, not, he's a brick. His hands yeah. are, yeah, his hands are so big. He just, he just, he's not good with, with the traditional shot. And, Sh you know, Shaq didn't, wasn't about it just because like, nah, it's going to make me look like. Aesthetic. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. a good luck, right? Yeah, but he, yeah. Maybe the, he the pride shot, got in the way, right? Maybe he could have shot 60% from the line, which would have been good for him. That's just this. The point is the ego, right? Like his ego got in the way of potentially maybe having him become a better free throw shooter. Yeah. And so then they couldn't the do a half world, attack anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so same, exactly. It's so the same thing in the bodybuilding world. Like our ego gets in the way. We try to defend like what we're doing. 
So would you consider it to actually be cheating if it's safe and standardized technique? Because I know yeah. a lot of people say that's cheating. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. If it's standardized and people are doing it and they're progressing and they're doing it safely. How's it, how, is it, how can it be cheating then? I agree. And no one else is being hurt by it. So how could it be cheating? Yeah, it seems like that's the wrong terminology. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw out some quotes that you've said in the past. Uh, just give me your first thought. Oh my gosh, you did some research. Um, I did. All right, I'm so excited. the first one here is, I play to my strengths and I game plan to my weaknesses. Yeah, I might have said that. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Play to my strengths. Um, so yeah, I think anything I do in life, you know, that's definitely something I do, whether it's bodybuilding or shooting hoops with my son out front. Okay. Uh, being a dad, it's like, okay, if, play to the strength, but the weaknesses. Yeah. Let's, let's identify that. Let's see if we can improve upon that. But, you know, sometimes I think we can be too focused on our strengths because who wants to like, who wants to have your, you know, deal with your weakness. Like sometimes like, nah, I don't want to deal with that. Like I don't, it's, so sometimes you just have to face it and then find ways to get better at it. Like for me personally, like in the bodybuilding world, like one of my weaknesses is, the refeeds, you know, days where you eat more food and this is for recovery and that type of thing. Well, I would make excuses and go, well, I think I need extra here or, you know, Hey, you know, I'm out with my family. I can, I can, you know, be a little bit looser. And then, you know, instead of having, let's say 20 at hundred calories, it turns to 4,000. Yeah. So to hold myself accountable to that, that's where I brought in a coach. I'm like, okay, Eric, I need you to keep on my ass for the last eight weeks, you know, heading into the muscle mayhem back in 2019. So you can hold me accountable. And so, you know, sometimes you have to do that. You have to find ways to better, better those weaknesses. You know, if you can't do it yourself, you know, outsource. Absolutely. All right. Next one here is think of the middle ground as a mechanics toolbox in that toolbox. There are an array of tools to use for the many jobs a mechanic must perform. Okay. Good example would be Mike Menser's hit and the high volume camp, right? Like back in the day it would have been like Arnold Schwarzenegger because they used to debate that all the time. You know, so it's like, you know, are you going to take high volume? And, you know, again, if you're, I don't know, let's say you're working 60 hours in that week, like there's no way you're going to be able to do high volume. I mean, you could, but you're probably going to be really run down and you're going to have some areas of life that's probably not going to be all that productive. So it's like, okay, do you, do you use that tool, which is a hammer, which, okay, we're trying to get the oil filter out. Am I going to use this hammer to get oil filter out? You know, maybe Mike Mincer's high intensity, you know, for that week of training might make a little bit more sense. So that's the specialty needed for that particular job to be productive and to do it efficiently, efficiently and effectively. So as bodybuilders, you know, sometimes we can get caught up in the camps out there. Yep. And that's why I'm talking about the middle ground is like, you can, you can follow a camp, learn from it, but don't get sucked into it as if it's a vacuum. He's like, Hey, look, Hey, let me see what they're doing. Okay. What are they doing? Good. Maybe what aren't they doing? Good. How can I apply what they're doing? Maybe to my situation. Then you look at the other camps, you kind of do the same thing. And then what you end up doing is you realize like, okay, I have like all these different types of tools that I can work with. And that's kind of the middle ground. And this is um, like something I learned, like working at the auto plant, because I worked in the auto plant there in Fremont before yeah. it was Tesla uh, for like 16 years. And the way that which this was the Toyota and General Motors. So it was more of the uh, Toyota production system. So they, they wanted to make sure that you're doing everything the same. You're everything standardized. Yeah. So that's the way they get the most quality out of their vehicles. But when I got trained, I got trained by one person on every specific job I did. It was one person teaching me everything and I'm left-handed, but yet he's showing me how to do things with right hand. I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. Interesting. So when I became a team leader, I don't, don't tell the, the people that my bosses or anything, but when I would train people, I would have each person that I trained, they would train with every person on my team. So that way they can pick something up from each person and make it their own. I think as bodybuilders, that's something that I've learned through the years is like, okay, yeah, I was doing Mike Mincer's hit. I learned from that. 
learned a little bit from Arnold. I learned from the guy that taught me hit, you know, some of his techniques with how he done some exercises. I've learned from Eric Helms. I've learned from Alberto Nunez. Um, sure. I'm sure like after this podcast is over, I'll listen to it and see if there's anything that maybe you have said. Um, so just little things that I might be able to tuck away in a sense, because later down the road, I might be able to pull back, pull it back out for a specific job at hand. So I think it's just having like humility when you're absorbing a lot of like the content that's out there and understanding that we're all human and we're all not perfect. There's things we do well and there's things we don't do well. So you play the strengths, improve the weaknesses. Absolutely. I uh, started my career in sales. And what we used to do is we would do uh, sitting with the team lead. So we would sit and we'd listen in on their conversations. And what you would learn really quickly is that each one of these people were very successful, but for wildly different reasons. Mm -hmm. Some people, it was strictly relationships. Some people were very technical. Some people were just good at being quiet and listening. So you were able to pick things up from different people. But if you just look at them at a quantifiable their sales numbers they were all pretty close but how they got there was wildly different steph curry and rick berry right exactly we're back at that now yep all right next one here uh i i uh feel this a lot being a dad you find ways to get shit done that is so true right we just we just recorded a dad podcast by the way it's coming out for father's day awesome oh man you know what i learned like my first contest prep with my son I, he was two at the time so that was the first time doing an extreme thing in bodybuilding with a family so it was almost like oh my gosh what am i going to do i can't train at certain days during the week like you know it's, i can't do mondays not chest day anymore it's like if i have to take him to the dentist or I have to do to the doctor or what have you it's like i can't just you know what can't do that i gotta train that's higher priority so i learned to be flexible and long story short, at the end of the contest prep, it was my best season ever. Like I ended up winning pro shows and placing top four at Worlds while being very flexible. And I would have thought of I never could have did that prior to that. Because, you know, as bodybuilders, we need to be hardcore. Everything needs to be like absolutely perfect the whole way through. So that kind of was enlightening. It was like, okay, so I can be flexible with my training. I can be flexible with the diet at times doesn't mean I'm like deviating from anything. It just means like, okay, instead of training on Monday, I just have to train on Tuesday. I didn't lose muscle from Monday to Tuesday. And then you kind of realize, well, to actually see muscle loss, it takes, I don't know, anywhere between three to five weeks of no training whatsoever. It's like, okay, I'm still training. It's only been a day. So it's not, so I just, you know, you get more comfortable being flexible and being a little bit more balanced. And, yeah. you know, as intermediates, sometimes and noobs, like we, we think we have to be just absolutely perfect. And we always want answers ahead of time. For sure. I, uh, I still struggle with that. The being flexible versus being rigid, because a lot of my success happened earlier on in my career from a business standpoint before I had kids. So I'm like, this is the way to do things. And then when things kind of get in my way and mess up my time, uh, I can be probably not the most pleasant person to be around. And then when I'm flexible in the moment, I'm like, oh, this is going well. But then, you know, those old thoughts and habits kind of push back. So I feel like you get things done as a dad, you make it work. Um, but unfortunately, for me at least, sometimes those old thoughts and behaviors kind of keep creeping back in. Yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, to admit, yeah, I'll be honest, I get antsy sometimes. Like if mm -hmm. there, let's say I have a two or three day stretch where I'm like, Shh, I can't train because... I'm taking care of, of life. I'm like, it's like, man, I, I really want to get in there. And you feel like you're regressing, but you're really not. It's just that desire and that love for training that it just gets me a little irritated at times. Yeah. But I mean, you know, how it is you expose yourself to, you know, situations that aren't always comfortable. You learn to get a little bit more comfortable, maybe not a hundred percent, but you get a little bit better. Like, the Jeff from 20 years ago, like not being able to train for three days, I would have been like, yeah, like, like you said, like probably wouldn't really be around me. I'd be a little bit more irritable and it'd be expressive, right? It'd be yeah. like now if I'm irritated, I don't express it and have it go on to my family. You know, it's just kind of within I'm a little yeah. bit antsy and irritated. 
So that's kind of the difference. And that's just takes exposure and some maturity, you know, over time you get better at it. Yeah. I'm aware of it at least. So I'm still working that's, on yeah, it. Yeah, I've got it better aware. at it, but you know, there's yeah. a, a part of my personality where it's like yeah. the brain's always on. So it's hard. Yeah. Well, my, I can tell too, like if let's say it's a little bit more expressive, you know, cause I have awareness, but sometimes you don't have full awareness. Like my wife will tell me or not tell me, but she'll just be kind of like, not around i'm like where'd she go i go upstairs she's on her phone on the bed i'm like what are you doing she's like well yeah i'm just giving you your space i'm like okay. i get that too it's like Varun, why don't you go to your office and work for a couple of hours i yeah. think you need it and i'm like okay yeah. so that's when i know like okay i probably need to change my tune here but yeah all right uh next one quiet leadership not heroic leadership creates sustainable value over the long term did i say that you did Quiet leadership. What? Say to repeat that again. Quiet leadership, not heroic leadership, creates sustainable value over the long term. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, because you have quiet leaders, you have vocal leaders. I'm more of a I'm more of an introvert. Okay. I think I lead more so through actions. Um, this is outside of the bodybuilding world. Like because I've been a bodybuilding coach for 15 years. But prior to that, like I said, I worked in the auto plant. Yep. And I worked on the line for man. At least six, seven years before I became a team leader. Okay. And, you know, I was always the one that didn't really complain too much. I just do my job, do it with good quality and check out. Well, when I became team leader, I made it a point to help people. Some of the other team leaders, you can tell like half ass, lazy, you know. So what I realized was when I became a team leader and not just my own team was always asking me for help, but other teams, Members were asking me for their help. I'm like, well, why aren't they asking their team leader? So I realized like just how I perform my job, just doing what I'm supposed to do. Like the actions spoke volumes. So same thing as a bodybuilder, like, you know, I can, yeah, sure. I can maybe make five gazillion, you know, Instagram posts and posts constantly and just constantly being people's faces, you know, with my voice. But the, when you actually, you know, get to a world level and you do it multiple times, you may not win world championship. Like I'll probably never win a world championship, but I'm getting to that consistently on that level. Then, I mean, how can anybody like say like, okay, this guy's not doing what he should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I picked that quote is I agree with it. I think there's a time where you want to be loud and inspirational, but when it comes down to it, the people who rely on you, if you just get the job done consistently, and you take initiative and you do the right things when no one's looking, that means the world. And that really is a huge motivation piece. Yeah. Like, I mean, especially like social media too. Like there's a lot of loud people out there yeah. and they're in your face a lot constantly. It's almost to me, I kind of see some of those people as like, okay, you're just like one of those guys that sit at the end of a bar and you're bullshitting everybody. Yeah. I only joined social media this year uh so it's been good for you uh, an eye opener i've only done it because i've had to like dm people for interviews etc otherwise i would mm. choose not to yeah um but it's it's just interesting and i can i don't want to say i can see through the bs because i'm not saying it's always bs but there's certain sure. times where i'm like i'm unclear if this is uh a character or like true identity mm -hmm. right I try to like personally, yeah, I just try to be myself, whether I'm online or at home. I think that's easy, right? Because then you don't have uh, cognitive overhead thinking about what I'm going to say or what did I say in the past because you've just been authentic to yourself. Yeah, I think it probably takes a lot of energy to not be yourself, to be a, be a character. I would assume that's like kind of draining. I think so. And I've kind of seen that with, uh, you know, I've had some athletes over the years that, you know, you can tell that they're in character when they're online. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I can see like, okay, they're, it's almost like two different people. For it's sure. kind of an interesting dynamic. But yeah, I try to keep it real because, again, like I can relate to the people out there that have, you know, their, their nine to five job and they're trying to bodybuild. And, you know, them trying to follow like maybe what someone is preaching that's not too realistic with, you know, real world context. Like, I just want to be relatable to people like, hey, I'm just I'm just like you. I'm a guy that lifts weights. You know, most of the time for me, it's like the only difference is, is 
I've just been doing it a lot longer than someone else. It doesn't mean I'm above them. It just means I'm further down the road is all. And what I try to do is like, hey, you know, I've hit some road bumps along the way. And if I can like tell it like, hey, Vroon, this is, this is what might happen if you do this. Like I've done this like five times already. Like if it helps you to avoid a, a, a bump yeah. and it makes your journey smoother, then I feel good about it. So I try to pay my experiences forward as much as I can. Absolutely. Right. Learning from your mistakes is great, but if you can learn from others mistakes, it's even easier because then you kind of, yeah, it makes your life a little easier. Yeah. yeah. You miss that whole, that there's certain mistakes you have to learn yourself, but certain sure. ones, if you can just skip it over, yeah. then that's great. Yeah. You, you might even make the mistake, even though I've told you 10 times too, because I tell my son like, don't do that. Don't do that. And he does it anyway. It's like, well, okay, you, you really learn now. Yeah. Uh, parenting's a whole different story. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right. So you've mentioned, uh, even in this podcast, that trial and error has been your best teacher, not reading or listening to influencers. Can you maybe talk through some of the biggest things that you've learned nutrition wise over the years from trial and error? Mm -hmm. So back in the day, like before the internet was here, like I didn't have anywhere to learn nutrition, but Flex Magazine, maybe pick up a nutrition book up, you know, at a bookstore. Uh, but when I got into the world of contest prep, because I felt like everything needed to be like super rigid and accounted for, like my, there was no flexibility. So with nutrition, it was like, okay, I don't really have a huge knowledge base here. So I'll have egg whites, I'll have chicken breast, I'll have white rice, and uh, I had some raisins. Like that was my first contest prep. You wouldn't have string cheese? No, I don't think, not even know what string cheese was back then. <laughs> So that was my diet for like six weeks. And I didn't know anything about how to plan a diet as far as trajectory, as far as body weight trajectory. And back then, how you learn about shows is like you see a flyer on the gym wall, like, okay, there's a show. But the show was in six weeks. And long story short, I lost 30 pounds in six weeks. Wow. On this very rigid diet. And obviously, like, that's not healthy. Like micronutrients were missing, fiber intake was missing, like a lot of things were just missing. Um, even though it was a horrible experience, um, what it taught me was I can do this because I grinded for six weeks, lost 30 pounds, wasn't a great physique by any stretch of the imagination. But at the end of it, I'm like, I absolutely love this. Like, I just love that chase and that grind. I just need to get more educated as far as how to approach it. And that took a long time for me to figure out just because I didn't have the same type of resources that we have today. And also my personality and how I grew up, my background as far as like coming from divorced parents and, you know, I was one who was more of an introvert. So I wasn't really asking for help okay. when I probably should have been. So it was more like, okay, let me try to figure this out on my own. So I think it's, it's, it's empowering, but at the same time, it, you can hold yourself back by not, you know, asking for help. I don't know if a little pride got in the way with that at all or not, but yeah, I could have like fast tracked my progress a lot faster, you know, if I had more, more resources, you know, asking for help. Uh, so it wasn't until maybe, I don't know, 15, 16 years into the journey where I was like, okay, I'm starting wow. to figure things out. Yeah. So sometimes when you see people online now, like they, again, they want to know answers right now up front. So I'll get questions and it's like, I can tell you the answer, but it's really not going to teach you a whole heck of a lot. But if I say, Hey, let's, let's go through this actual experience. I don't know the answer myself, but if you trial and error it, you'll learn what works and what doesn't work. And from there you keep what works strengths, right? You know, okay, let's play to that and make it better. But the weakness is let's really try to change something and try to find something that might work a little bit better. And you keep evolving over time. And even now, like 38 years into this, I don't know everything there is to know about bodybuilding or myself. So to expect you as an intermediate or a newbie to like, I need all the answers right now. It's like, well, when you got to kindergarten, did you know, like, did you really expect you're going to get a college degree in kindergarten? I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> exactly. So it's just let that process unfold, let it evolve and, and be okay to explore and try new things. Awesome. As long as you don't get hurt. As long as you don't get hurt. All right, I'm going to move in a fun direction here. Uh, give me your Mount Rushmore, your four exercises that have made the biggest impact to your physique over the last five years. The last five years? 
I mean, you could do 10. I'll let you pick. I, yeah, I don't want to. I don't like these types of things. I don't like give lists because if I give lists, then someone's going to hear it like, okay, I need to do what Jeff does. I need to do RDL or I need okay. to do a Smith bench press. You know what I mean? So it's like, and it's always evolving. Like I could do an exercise for a month and then all of a sudden it starts to like, okay, my shoulder's starting to hurt now. Okay, now I need to go to a different movement or I need to modify that movement in order to do it pain free. So when it comes to like this, so let's, let's do this. So the way I look at exercise selection is obviously you want to know what that exercise does. Like, does it target the delts? Does it target the chest or what have you? Or it might target, you know, a few exercises. Like, okay, so get a good understanding of that. And, you know, the way I learned is I, I bought this book called Strength Training Anatomy and had a lot of uh, illustrations to it. Not a lot of text, just a lot of illustrations, but it's, it kind of said, okay, bicep curl. These, these are the, 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 the muscles that it works. The, the direct muscle and the indirect muscle. So I kind of learned from that book. And then from there, I'm like, okay, I kind of have an understanding there. Now I want to do exercises that are, that are safe and comfortable for me to do. And then the third thing would be like, do I enjoy doing the movement? And you can toss in, okay, is this exercise stable? Like mm -hmm. I'm able to perform the exercise with a lot of stability. That's how I kind of look at exercise selection. Oftentimes we'll look at like, okay, what is that gym bro doing? Or, what is this influencer saying or what it, what it, what does the science say too? even like it might say, okay, this is the most optimal exercise. But then the question is, is does my criteria fit that? Awesome. Oh, that totally makes sense. Not wanting to give a list because then people will do those four exercises. Cause you know, it's like squats, king of lower body exercises, deadlift, bench. Like those are, I mean, yeah, they're great movements. If you could do them comfortably and they're safe and you're progressing on them, then yeah, they're great movements. But then you have to factor in, okay, a deadlift is going to be harder to do than let's say an RDL. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to do than let's say hyperextension or a hip thrust. Uh, so it's like, okay, do I really have to do deadlift or can I do other movements uh, that's going to, let's say, not be as fatiguing? And then could you think about not just what you're doing in the moment, but how does that impact the next session, the, the next week, the next month? Like, how are these things, you know, playing with each other? Awesome. So, cool. So something that's been impressive so far is your longevity. You talk about, you know, bodybuilding and lifting for in, in decades, not in years. So um, is there a key to longevity that you think is underrated and one that's overrated? I think the overrated ones is like the stretching, the mobility work and all those things. Like to me, it's like, yeah, those are helpful. But I think what's really key is pace, like how you pace things and understanding that you're evolving over time. So like, so like you know, this is what I hear sometimes too. Like guys are starting to get into their 40s and 50s, like things start to hurt. Yeah. And instead of listening to that, they're trying to do the same things they used to do like when they were in their 20s. It's like they're not willing to change for whatever reason. You know, maybe it's fear-based. You know, if I don't keep doing, let's say, that deadlift, you know, I'm not going to make the same type of progress. So it's, you have to kind of just understand that you're going to evolve and your approach needs to evolve with it. And it's more about the pace. Okay. Yeah, I think I heard you say something like you're willing to explore even at an older age, and that's what keeps you young. And if you don't do that, that's how you kind of become irrelevant and a dinosaur. You become a dinosaur, yeah. It's like if you're still trying to do hold on to the things you used to do 30 years ago, it's like, well, you're kind of missing the boat. Because <laughs> it's almost like, I mean, obviously you're, you're into technology. Like imagine trying to do startup companies, but you're still working as if you're in 1975. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work out so well. Exactly. Often. So it's like you have to evolve. And, and, you know, I'm not perfect. Like there's still some things that I probably do from 20 years ago that I probably can change and, and adapt. But eventually I start to catch on. Like length and partials at first is a good example. It's like, well, man, everybody's like, everybody's starting to do these. Like it's almost like, okay, is this, is this like more beneficial than doing full range of motion? And we're kind of learning now through the research. Like, yeah, it probably, probably is more productive, but then you have the camp that takes a length and partial and take it to an extreme so all they or, do. or the range of motion. Like I'm trying to get this stretch. Now I'm like doing these exercises with 
this extreme stretch and then, okay, now I have shoulder pain or something like that. So sometimes we could just take something that's new and shiny and, you know, maybe go way too extreme with it. It's kind of like BFR training, you know, back when it first came out and came to like, everybody is running around the gym with, you know, cuffs on their arms. Yeah. Like, but now it's like, okay, it's just a tool, you know, it's again, tool in the toolbox. Right. So it's, it's just a tool. You pull it out when, when it's required. Yeah. I think it's uh, I don't know if it's like an art, right. You have to figure out when to take in new information and apply it without just jumping on every wave and bandwagon right away, but also not, being on the other side of things where you're just never going to accept new information and practices It's middle, middle ground, that right? middle and ground is, and, and but, people don't like the middle ground because it's, it's not exciting. It's not polarizing. Like exactly. Know, and, yeah. And, and we live in a world where the louder and the more polarizing you are, the more attention you get. And attention mm -hmm. is kind of like a currency that people use. So people don't want to hear like, do what makes sense for you to adhere long term and take in information and use that information when it makes sense to you because it's not it's either not polarizing enough or it's not direct enough of saying you do this you'll see those results right yeah people want to be told what to do they want the answer like what is going to give me the best thing bang for my buck so if they see the new shiny toy they're like all right this length and partial thing like this is going to just really expedite things and I think it's good to like, okay, hey, let's, this is this new concept. How do I apply this new concept? But at the same time, let's just not throw out everything that I've done that's yielded a lot of success for me. So eventually what I started doing with it was, okay, let me, let me add this onto a pull down. Last set, let's do two or three partials at the end. Let's explore that. Let's see what it's about. But let's let's continue to do the full range of motion reps in there still. Like let's get a good two sets of that in there. The third set, okay, let me just do two or three partials in there, and let's see how that goes. So I eventually kind of just you know dabbled with it, and then I kind of got to the point where I was like, okay, all my pull downs were going length and partials. But then it was like, it's almost like I went from here to here, like you talked about. It's like, okay, yeah. let me bring it back to the middle again. Yeah, I spoke with. Uh... Uh, Milo Wolf on that. I said, it's kind of like what proportion of your reps are in a more lengthened position than a shortened? Like that might be a good way to think about it. Like I'm doing 60% of my work in a lengthened position as opposed to I'm changing my exercise selection and I'm just doing lengthened partials. That doesn't seem like it's realistic for most lifters. Mm -hmm. I think I would think about too, like the, okay, what loading are you able to use? Like is there any pain associated with what you're doing? Like, there's just so many different variables to look at. Um, so, I mean, that's where I kind of like refer out to like Eric Helms, like, Hey, you know, uh, how would we go about, you know, programming this in a practical way, mm -hmm. you know, not just based on what the research is showing, but like in the real human, like experiment, like how would we go about this in someone's daily life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the, it's important to look at research, but I, I personally have bias towards trial and error because that's, what's been more successful in multiple aspects of my life, but I can understand folks who kind of lean on the other side because that's their experience as well. Yeah. Like if you're someone new, like coming in, like imagine coming into the world of bodybuilding, like, what do I do? You know, do I listen to this bro over here or do I listen to what maybe do I pay attention to the research? It's like the research, the way I kind of look at it is it helps us to get us in the ballpark, right? Mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm out there in center field now, but now it's like, okay, now I got to pay attention to where that ball is. How do I play the game now? And that's where the trial and error plays a big role. It's like, okay, I got, again, going back to our original um, conversation starter with the volume, like 10 to 20 sets, right? It's like, okay, that's science saying, hey, you're in the ballpark now. Where do I go from there? Well, now it's, it's trial and error. Is it going to be, is my realm going to be 10 to 15? Is it going to be 15 to 20? Is it going to be below 10 or do, am I an outlier? Like, I don't even, I'm just different. Like, do I need more than 30 sets to actually generate progress? So that's the way I kind of look at it, you know, as far as like the science, like, I think it's, it's definitely helpful and useful, you know, cause you have the, again, those camps, the experience camp, the trial and error camp, then you have the, the science camp and sometimes they'll just bash each other. And it's like, no, there's a middle ground there. Yeah. There's a middle ground there. And, um, 
I think everyone has the best of intentions. So it's, you know, trying to work and collaborate as a community. And then as an individually individual, being able to think critically and say, okay, what's kind of that middle ground? And maybe I should start there. And then based on experience, I can lean in one direction or the other mm-hmm. more. It's the, like, I remember, again, going back to the auto plant, we had, um, like, being online, you know, more of the blue-collar laborer than you have the white-collar, the engineer. And, you know, of course, they got the layout of how this car should be built, and they have certain processes, like how you supposed to be doing your job in order to, you know, build that quality as, you know, that car is with as much quality and efficiency as possible. They would come down to the floor watch us work and then tell us that we're not doing something right. It has to be done a specific way. And it would just be two egos going like this instead of like listening to both sides say, okay, why do you want me to build the car this way? And then maybe them asking us, well, why are you building it Mm. that way? So maybe that process could have been even more effective and even more efficient if the egos would have just been like, you've just been more humble. And yeah, listen. absolutely. Um, so I have a kind of practical question. So as someone who's in his late 30s, turning 40 this year, and I'd say I'm an intermediate lifter, so there's still gains to be made. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have concerns around bulking due to things like, you know, diabetes and things like that in my family. Um, like, how would you think through, you know, that dilemma in terms of, you know, should someone be bulking as they get older and have uh, are worried about things like health concerns? I would need to kind of know if they're already healthy or not. Okay. If there's health concerns, you know, I think gaining weight and doing it the wrong way would be a little bit, uh, I'd be worried about that. Yeah, yeah. Like I probably wouldn't have someone do that. So I do, that's something as a coach, I do take into consideration first and foremost is where's this person out health, health wise, you know, I'm dealing with someone who's 40 years old and they have bad habits and those types of things. Like, Hey, I want to, get more muscle and you know, I'm not going to have them gain 15, 20 pounds. Like, Hey, let's put you in a bowl. Like let's, let's clean up those habits first and foremost. And of course, you know, let's make sure you're training properly and those types of things. But I wouldn't be overly concerned about actually adding muscle onto this particular, particular person. Okay. Be more so let's, let's get their health markers in order. Let's get their habits in order first and foremost, because you need those habits in order to be a better bodybuilder, better lifter anyways. Yeah, absolutely. So chances are, if you improve just the habits alone, you're probably going to see a change in the physique from that in itself. Yeah, I guess in, in my situation, I'd say like, my health is good. I've been on track, I've been progressing. But there's, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a fear. It's just, there's some a, concern about bulking It's like, okay, I know I'm going to put on muscle and there's muscle to put on, but I'm also going to put on fat. And I don't want that to potentially mess up my blood markers, et cetera, which right now are all good. Well, if you think about it, like look at other sports, let's say, look at a football player, offensive lineman, there's a lot of body fat on them. Yeah. But I mean, if you gave them blood work and all that, you know, chances are maybe their health is like really, really good because maybe they're really active and maybe the diet, the, the foods they're eating are maybe quote unquote healthier foods. They're just eating more abundance of it. So, you know, it's hard to, it's really hard to say if someone is truly healthy or not, just by looking at them on the outside, because there's skinny people out there in the world that are really unhealthy, but on the outside, you would think they're healthy, but they're actually not. They got bad habits. You just happen to have an okay metabolism, keep them fairly skinny. So, I mean, I guess blood work can kind of tell you a lot. Yeah. And you can always monitor that, but I would, yeah, I would be like, for me as a coach, like red flag is like, okay, if someone's bad habits and they're like, okay, we got, I want to, you know, put some weight on to try to get some more muscle. I'm like, well, let's fix these other things first. For sure. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw some images on the screen. Uh, tell oh, me. Wow, this is, this is different. All right. Here yeah. We so, there, so we actually already talked about this. So I'm going to throw this up here. This is the, uh, strength training anatomy book. So oh, uh, got it. it's got sitting book. right next to me too. All right. So what's the first thing that comes to mind, even though I know we already kind of spoke on it? Probably to me, anyways, for me, like just for you, visually the best teaching book out there on what exercise does what. And just to get a basic understanding around that, I think this is definitely a go to. Like even in today's social media world, I don't know if you can maybe see this online or not. 
But, you know, you get a hard copy of, of a book, man. It's always nice to have like a hard copy on hand. The photo qualities always look so good when you have a physical book. It always looks better than the images do uh, online. Yeah. And it's cool, too, because, I mean, look at the picture. Like, I mean, how cool does that look? That guy shredded. Like, so if anything, I mean, just looking at the pictures in that perspective, it's cool. Awesome. All right. Next one here is uh, this is not a rusty hatchet, but what's the symbolism of a, a rusty hatchet? Oh, today? yeah. Okay. So this, so this, I was telling this story. I don't remember how I told it, but when I was about, I think I was in like seventh, eighth grade, somewhere in there, like my stepfather was a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, you know, he, he was stern. Uh, but he was always trying to teach me life lessons. He just did it in a really rough way. So the story is we were trying to uh, build a uh, like an outside patio and we wanted to put some brick pavers in. And in order to do that, we need to remove a tree root that was sticking above ground. So he's like, I need you to remove that root. And he gave me a hatchet just like that. But it was rusted and it was very dull. And I looked at him, I go, well, look, we got a chainsaw. <laughs> it's like, no, you're using that. Okay. And I'm like, okay. So literally it took me, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours, however long it was to get through this tree root. My hands were all blistered out. And, you know, when I was done, he came up and said, okay, this is a lesson for you that you need to get an education. Like if you don't want to do physical work like this, when you get older, you need to be educated. So that that's the story of that hatchet. And so in a sense, what he, he taught me was work smarter, not harder. So as a coach, you know, even with myself and my bodybuilding journey, it's not just about trying to like outwork, but to work, find ways to work, you know, smarter, to get more efficient with what you're doing. So again, going back to our volume discussion, do I need 20 sets here that are fluffy or do I need to do eight to 10 sets with a lot more quality? Absolutely. I also heard you say something that I feel like it was similar, but it was more about like burning out. So I think you mentioned like digging a tunnel through a mountain and you have a pickaxe. If you strike it too hard, it's going to break the axe. And if you keep going, you're going to blister yourself up. So it seems like uh, you have a lot of axe related uh, analogies going right. on. Some blades, right? Yeah. 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 But there's a story there. All right. Next one here is... Uh, a 3D MJ book that was given to you. That's uh so we had an athlete named David um and he made this book for me. So inside the book, which my computer is sitting on top of right now because I'm using it as a tripod. Um yeah, the he basically put my entire 2014 contest prep. Like there's pictures of my shows in there, there's pictures of my family. And I mean it was probably the most thoughtful gift I've ever gotten. Uh, from one of our athletes and so it, it definitely means a lot and just to have that there and open it up and it just brings back so many memories and again that's the prep where I learned to be flexible with my approach learning how to be a dad and a bodybuilder at the same time and doing like both things extremely well like because that's my goal is of course to be elite bodybuilder but I definitely want to be more of an elite dad so yeah, that, that book definitely has a place in my heart. Awesome. All right. The last one here is what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this? Oh man, those are my brothers. So my brothers and my sister. Uh, so, you know, growing up, of course, I had a lot of real brothers, um, but a divorced family, you know, sometimes it's, you know, relationships, you know, it can be strained because of that distance. So meeting these guys and this, you know, Andrea there, like informing the team that we have here is probably my most proud achievement in the sport of bodybuilding because every one of us is about helping others. Like when we first started 3D Muscle Journey, it wasn't like, hey, I'm in this for the money. Um, even today, like we do a lot of things like from a business sense, like there's probably things we can do a heck of a lot better. But we think about how, like what we're doing, how is this going to help people? And, you know, if we're putting that energy out and it sends paying it forward, then we'll get paid back, you know, one way or another. So it's just, yeah, those, I mean, that's basically my brothers, my sister. And then the, uh, 
the painting there, the drawing, uh, that gentleman there at the bottom, um, just an extremely talented artist. So he presented that to us when we were doing a seminar. Uh, and that's actually hanging right here in my office now. That same same. Uh, piece. I was just going to ask where that lives. So it seems like it, that's it's there, right the here, right above my my computer. So every everything, day I come to work. everything we talked about is in your uh, in that room that you're in right now. It seems like yeah, it's like the computer, like the the book, the three D muscle journey books under my computer. Uh, the strength of anatomy books, like sit right here. That's funny. Um, and then, and and then, you know, you mentioned like these are your brothers and sisters and a couple of things came to mind when I was doing research. You mentioned that you went to like a Washington show and that's where you kind of really built more rapport with Eric and Berto. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious your thoughts on like taking advantage of opportunities, because if you, you know, miss it, it can change the whole trajectory of your life. Like, I guess, you know, does that resonate with you at all? Big time. It's, it's kind of crazy because I think back. Like in 2009, when I did that contest prep, and this was after I kind of said I was done with bodybuilding as far as competitive bodybuilding, my whole perspective shifted as far as how I approach it. Because prior to that, it was more about like, okay, I'm trying to win a pro card. I'm trying to win shows, trying to get notoriety. Uh, and then, of course, being disappointed because I never attained that goal. I got depressed and down about it. I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. You know, so then... Prepping in 2009, the, sh the perspective shifted towards, I just want to have fun doing this. And whatever result I get, I get. I just want to like actually enjoy the journey itself. And that's why I named 3D Muscle Journey, 3D Muscle Journey, because it is a journey. Uh, so meeting these guys uh, along the way that season, um, I don't think I would have been open to them prior to that because I was so competitive. Okay. Backstage, it shows like, yes, you can approach me. I might be, you know, nice and casual, but I wasn't there to like meet friends and to, you know, talk it up. I was like, I was there to actually beat you. <laughs> I want to win a pro card. So just, you know, of course, Eric being as outgoing as he is, he's like, hey, Jeff, you know, like, you know, you go on the bodybuilding.com forums. I'm like, I don't even know what that is, Eric. Uh, but long story short, yeah, it's just, you know, I was more open and, and, like more humble, I guess, in a way. And it allowed me to form friendships. And of course, from those friendships, then of course, you know, we started a company. And then of course, now we're helping a ton of people. So my life definitely changed for the better because of that. And, um, and it's crazy too, is like in 2009, I, I took second place at the Muscle Man by one point. And I was happy. I'm like, good, okay, you know, I didn't, I didn't win. You know, I'm good, lost by a point. And I started to eat food again. Okay. Enjoying life. And then the head judge of that show called me up and he says, Hey, Jeff, you got a lot of potential. Get back on your diet, go to Washington and, uh, you know, let's get that pro card. So I was like, nah, I ain't going to do that. But eventually I did, I got back on it. And then that's where I met these guys, like really formed relationships with these guys. And then I got my pro card by one point. Wow. That's a good story. And it I think it just teaches people as well, like take advantage of the opportunities in front of you because they may seem small, but they can, they can be large. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, already talking with Eric and, and Berto, I can see kind of the, the character and the long-term mindset of the team. And there's a quote I used to have in my office and it's just saying, play long-term games with long-term oriented people. And uh, that's, that's the vibe I get from you and your team. Yeah, no doubt. Like, I mean, when it's all said and done, right? Like I think, and this is something I've learned from like older people that, you know, they're ready to lead the world. They're like, you know, every time you kind of listen to them and they have regrets, it's almost like you can't take things with you. you no, know, the money and the material stuff and all that. So again, it's like, I know we can probably make a lot more money from a business perspective, but it's almost like the, what we're doing is it's, it's more than just about money or the fame or any of that stuff. It's like, I use bodybuilding as a, as a vessel to connect with people. Like, again, if I, if I, let's say I lost by one point and I decided not, I didn't get that phone call from the head judge and say, Hey Jeff, get back in here and do this. You and I would not be having this conversation right now. That's crazy. And so, I, I might slightly disagree on the, the money thing. Cause I think that might be a short term mentality because 
I feel like character is something that can take decades to build up and reputation, but it can be destroyed in a few minutes. Um, so I think if you just kind of focus on having that right character and that reputation, that good things will come. I know myself in the past, we've had products that we've sold for much less than we probably could have maximized, but I felt like I was doing the greater good. I was still happy with the profit coming in. So it just seemed like a win-win. And that's naturally got in people to support me and help me and make intros. And it's hard to quantify what that value really is. Yeah, no, that I totally that. That's basically our concept. Awesome. Yeah. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Where can everyone find you? 3dmusclejourney.com, uh, 3dmjgodfather underscore, um, 3dmj underscore godfather at Instagram. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it.